I'm not gonna lie to you, that tastes really good. George, knock it off. Hey, gross. Why is it that some champagne bottles have a vintage date on them and some others don't? Non-vintage wines are the bread and butter of all the different champagne houses in the Champagne region of France. That's what they're selling, a brand or a style of wine. Moet is going to be different than Paul Roger, is going to be different than Vaux Clicquot. They have a different style. Vintage champagnes are champagnes that are from a particular year that the champagne house said this was a great year and we want to reflect this in the bottle. So what happens is when you make a vintage wine you're also getting wines that are from a better village and a better vineyard. And there's also aging requirements for these different champagnes. A non-vintage champagne has to be aged a minimum 15 months in the bottle that it was fermented in before it can be released into the public. Your vintage dated champagnes have to be aged a minimum 36 months in the cellar prior to being released to the public. So if you see a vintage date on a bottle of champagne, what is happening is that champagne house is telling you, the consumer, that we think we had such a great year in 1990, 1995, 1996, that we want this champagne to express that. Hope you learned something today. I'm John Grossweiler. Always be passionate, never pretentious. This is Vernon. He's my new puppy. We do lots of stuff together. Watch movies. Not best in show again. Play games. Now you know that is not how you spell neuter. Lots of stuff. When it comes to dinner time though, we usually go to our separate spots. Not anymore. I'm making recipes that you and your pet can share together. This is Pet Chef. So today we are going to be making some banana pudding, right Mr. Vernon? Yes, this is one of your favorites, so pay attention. So you just take one banana, peeled, and just in a bowl, you're just gonna break it up into some big chunks. Just gonna mash it down. I think a fork's pretty easy. Just get all the banana mashed into the bottom of the bowl. So once the banana's mashed, you're gonna take two teaspoons of a low-fat cottage cheese and just add right into there. Then you're gonna take one teaspoon of a low-fat yogurt and add that in and just stir. And once it's ready, we will enjoy some quick and easy, healthy banana pudding. So once you get the banana pudding all plated and looking pretty to suit Mr. Vernon's very fancy taste, it's gonna serve him just a very little bit right there. There you go, buddy. That good banana pudding. Serve myself a little bit. Cheers, enjoy, buddy. Mmm, that is very good. In order to cook good food, you just need to use all of your five senses. Sight, touch, hearing, smell, start to get some great taste. One time I wound up in a certain amount of trouble with uh, the head chef of a restaurant I was working at, the Danube uh, restaurant, which was a David Boulay, presently is a David Boulay restaurant, Austrian. We began to uh, bring in a lot of whole animals and uh, were interested in breaking those animals down. So we began to bring down uh, whole lambs and uh, whole pigs from Vermont and various other locations and eventually we developed a separate facility from the Danube to uh, handle, all the, uh, handle all the carcasses. 
and it was my job uh, in the middle afternoon to to cross Dwayne Street from the actual restaurant and go over to the to the kind of meat holding facility and 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 pick out the carcasses that I wanted to work with that day, and then return them to, to the restaurant like a sack or something. I would just kind of sling these carcasses over my shoulder so I could be seen, you know, walking across the street in midday with you know two pigs and a and a lamb hanging off my back, which I thought really showed my you know my oneness with the product. And this went on for a number of weeks, um, and slowly but surely, uh, all the people that lived in the neighborhood got uh, unpleasantly familiar with seeing uh, the midday uh, uh, transfer of these animals, and uh, so they began to call the restaurant. And uh, one day, when I was kind of just about to cross the street and and, and bring all my animals uh, back over to the restaurant, uh, Chef Goulet called me into the office and uh, told me I would have to come up with a <laughs> different transportation plan for my uh, for my mise en place for that day. Making risotto: stock, pepper, arborio rice, white wine, onion, salt, butter, Parmesan cheese. First, bring your stock to a simmer. Now, with your very sharp knife, small dice half an onion. Take your large pot, turn on the heat, and toss in one tablespoon of butter. Once it's melted, add your onion with a little bit of salt and sweat until translucent in about 10 or 15 minutes. Once your onions are soft, add your arborio and toast it in the pan until they become translucent as well. Once you can sort of see through the rice grains, add your wine. As the wine cooks down, make sure that any of the scum on the top of your simmering stock gets removed. Once the wine is cooked down all the way, go ahead and add enough stock to cover the rice. From this point, cook the rice until all of the stock is absorbed, and then you'll have to add a little more stock in increments of about one cup at a time. Add a cup, let it cook down. Add another cup, let it cook down again. Throughout this whole process, you must gently stir the rice to create the starchy liquid element of the risotto. Once the rice is finally cooked, it'll probably take many one cup stock additions. Turn off the burner and add the rest of the butter and the Parmesan cheese. If you leave the heat on under the rice, the butter and cheese will break in your pan, leaving you with a huge, greasy mess. At the end, if your risotto is too tight, add a little more stock. It should be pourable, verging on the consistency of soup. Make sure to season properly at the end, and then serve with a little bit of extra Parmesan cheese. One of the problems we have with medieval recipes is they don't have quantities. So we never know how much of any given spice, how much of any given meat, what is supposed to go in there. Do we know how big a medieval capon was? No, but we can guess at it. Figure today a capon is about 10 pounds, probably in the Middle Ages they were little. They were probably about 5 pounds. So you won't be able to buy a 5 pound capon, but you can buy a 5 pound chicken. So cut up your chicken into seven or eight pieces, and now we've got chicken in eight pieces. I like to reserve all the rest of this stuff for chicken broth. And so this is a fairly straightforward procedure. You take some lard, of course lard is pig fat that has been melted, put it in a nice hot pan, and then brown your chicken. And while this is browning, and this is going to take a while, about 10 minutes or so, let's deal with the spices. If you know anything about medieval cooking, you know that the food used lots of spices, but they were mostly sweet spices like ginger, clove, cinnamon. The sweet spices, or spezia dolce, came premixed, kind of like curry powder or pumpkin pie spice. They were much more sophisticated about where to get their spices in those days. So it looks like our chicken's almost done, nice and brown. So pour off the lard into something, leaving just a little bit. Put the chicken back in there. And now just a smattering of spices, cinnamon stick, a few chunks of nutmeg, and a few cloves, and of course some salt as well. 
add a little chopped up ginger and about a half a gram of saffron. And that's only half of it. There's a lot of saffron in this dish. Cover the thing up and let it cook for a while. One of the critical ingredients in medieval food is almond milk. Almost every other recipe seems to have almond milk in it. And to make almond milk, you take some almonds, take some water, same idea really as making coconut milk. And in this particular recipe, you also take some vinegar. How much vinegar is really up to you. You need to taste the recipe at the very end of cooking. So turn the thing on and puree. And pour it through a sieve so that you get all the almond pieces out. You've got this gorgeous orange color which comes from the saffron. And this was very, very highly prized in those days. Gold was the color that everybody wanted to have. So about halfway through cooking, you add chopped up dates, you add prunes, raisins, or currants in this case, and some almonds. And it is at this point that you add about half of those sweet spices. And then just let it cook for a minute or two. And let's put this on the serving platter and see what our tasting panel has to say to this one. The Ambrosino. So dig in. So is this like a hands-on thing? Yes, but you can use your knife. You see, you were able to use a knife to cut things. I thought the spices were going to be way overwhelming. The chicken is cooked really well. It was good. It was really good. I like the sweetness and I like the prunes. Cheese is easy. Do you like cheese? Do you like cheese? Do you like cheese, sir? Most people seem to think it's hard. Really good cheese. Do you like cheese? Try to figure out what their comfort level is. Cheese. Welcome to Cheese 101. This is the hard cheese segment. Now, it doesn't mean like it's for geeks or anything, it just means that the cheese we're talking about today is hard. What is hard cheese? They take the curds, they put it in a press or in a, in a basket, um, and they press down on the curds so it squeezes some of the moisture out. And then they age that cheese for a long time. Uh, sometimes uh, six months, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, a year, two years. There's a cheese in Holland that's called Chalda. You may know it as Gouda, but if you're one of those people who likes to say Vincent van Gogh, <laughs> sorry, um, then you would also say Chalda instead of Gouda. That cheese can be aged for four to five years. So you get the picture, right? As it ages, what happens to it? Somebody once said, um, cheese is milk's leap to immortality. That's exactly what's happening here. He was thinking of hard cheese, because after a couple of years, it just gets harder and harder and drier. Now, if you did it with a small cheese, it would get unattractively hard. The outside would be all dry and crunchy. Um, but they do it usually in big wheels. I don't have a big wheel here, but you can see that these are cut from big format cheeses. That enables it to stay moist enough on the inside over a couple of years. And they have wonderful flavor, um, these hard cheeses. Um, you know what they taste like? I used to say to my dad all the time, Dad, smell this wine. What does it smell like? He'd go, I don't know, it smells like wine. Hard cheese smells like cheese. All those things that you think of as cheesy cheddar, uh, Swiss, uh, even Parmigiano, Reggiano, you know what I mean? They smell like cheese. Other cheeses may smell like nuts or truffles. These cheeses smell like cheese. Now, most often, hard cheese is made from one type of milk, though there are exceptions, which I'll show you in a moment. But that type is, well, here, you pick. Which one? Oh, you said this one. No, oh, you said this one. Okay. That's it. We have here three cow's milk hard cheeses. That's what you most typically see. And he's just scampering along and he's very happy, my little cow. Um, I'm gonna show you this one first. This is called Cantelet. It comes from the center of France, from Auvergne. It's a kind of mass-produced cheese, so it's not one of my favorites, but it's cow's milk. And you can cut this with one of these nifty Scandinavian cutters. And you get a piece just like that. 
This one is called Comte. Its full name is uh, French Gruyere de Comte. It's like Gruyere cheese, but it's made on the French side of the border near Lake Geneva. And this is really one of my favorite cheeses, uh, hard cheeses of all, the Comte. Probably the best of all is the Gruyere. You can see the name on here. And Gruyere, by law now, has to come from Switzerland. Also, it's right near this cheese, but it's a little special because of the conditions of that town. And you can see it's got just a little bit more of a, of a white shred to it, like it's promising even a little bit more flavor than this one. I'll taste them quickly. These are good cheeses. I like to eat them just by themselves. You have a piece of bread with butter. Definitely, mm, it's a little bit like a, like a baked potato, actually, but not that interesting. The Comte, oh, much more nuts and pasture. And then finally the Gruyere, which is one of the greatest melting cheeses in the world. Great for cooking, but it's also great by itself. You can also have this. Here we go. This is a sheep's milk cheese. This is perhaps one of the most famous of the hard sheep's milk cheeses. This cheese is called Manchego, and it comes from Spain. It comes from La Mancha to dream the impossible. What they do is they take this, this uh, sheep's milk, uh, the curds, they put it in a wheel, and the wheel has this imprint on the inside. So as it sits there for a long time, a year, year and a half, two and a half years, the cheese picks up this, um, this, this imprint on the outside. It sort of looks like a tire track. And since this is made from sheep's milk cheese, it's got a totally different taste, though it has a very similar kind of texture. But it's more, well, sheepy. It's more barnyardy. Absolutely. These are my friends, the hard cheeses. Visit them often. It's good, right? It's very nice. How come you love cheese? Because it's good. How to roast red peppers. Oil, salt, peppers. To roast red peppers quickly and easily, cover them with oil and a little bit of salt, then place them in a really hot oven, like 450 or 500 degrees. After 10 or 15 minutes, they'll start to blacken just as if they were flame roasted. Take them out and place them in a container, whether it be a Tupperware, Ziploc, or brown paper bag. This steams them out and makes it easier to separate the skins from the flesh. After they steam for about 10 minutes, pull them out and start peeling off the skins. Try not to run them under water as that washes away a lot of extra flavor. Once they're all cleaned up, go ahead and use them for an endless number of combinations and dishes.